Good morning. Let's stand together as we begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so very much that we can come together on this, the first Sunday in Advent. And I just pray, God, that we would be able to set aside everything, everything over the busy schedules that are, as we're looking at as we're going forward, and that we might worship you and honor you on this day. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. O come, O come, Emmanuel.
This was to make what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah come true. It says, here is my servant. I have chosen him. He is the one I love. I am very pleased with him. I will put my spirit on him. He will announce to the nations that everything will be made right. He will make right w when over wrong. He, the, the nations will put their hope in him. Matthew twelve seventeen through 21. And all together we say, we light the candle of hope, knowing beyond all doubt that our hope is in the coming of the Lord. Again, come before you, praising your holy name, and we thank you so very much for your presence here this day. You alone are worthy of our praise, worthy of our worship, because you are the Almighty. You are the one who is awesome, the one who is full of righteousness and holiness and faithfulness and justice, but love and grace and mercy as well. Thank you, God, for all that you are and for all that you have done for us and that all that you will do for us. Father, I just thank you for Jesus. I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, and he willingly, on his, uh, on his behalf, he willingly came to serve us by giving his life that we might be saved. 
Father, as you speak to us this morning, I pray that we would take to heart the words of comfort and encouragement, the words of challenge that you bring to us through your word this day. For we do pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You may be seated. So we are in Advent. And it may sound like we start things a little slow, right? The first couple of songs are a little slow. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and come thou long expected Jesus. And, and the, whole, the whole tenure of the first day of Advent is all about expectation and hope. And that's why we light the candle of hope. It's almost as if you're doing this kind of thing as you're ready to get in to Advent. Because that's the tone of Scripture as they set forth the fact that the Old Testament people, the Old Testament prophets were all looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. And when Jesus, uh, well, when John the Baptist shows up and begins to say he's coming, they're all still kind of going, um, we hope so. Our hope is in him. Our hope of the nations is in Jesus. My hope for salvation is in him. And so it starts out kind of slow. Expectation, expectation, and then bow. Here we are. Hope. The hope of the world. That's what Jesus is. And that's what the lighting of the first Advent candle is all about. And Thank you, Malia, for helping us with that this morning. By way of announcement, I certainly just want to welcome all of you. We're glad that you're here in the Lord's house on this His Day. I know He has a blessing for you for having been here and worshiping this first Sunday in Advent, the Sunday of Hope. There is an offering plate at the back for your tithes and offerings. There is also an app on your phone. If not, you can get it on your phone called GiveLify. It's a great way of giving to the church, your tithes and your offerings, or your missions money, or any other type of special offering that you might have uh, for the church and for the kingdom. You can also use your own checkbook if you have one and write a check to the church. But if you don't have your checkbook and you don't want to use Givelify, you can always use your bank's online bill pay service and just choose to have your bank write a check to the church and they mail it to us. And there's several that pay their tithes in that particular fashion. At this time, let's take up our Dime a Day missions offering. All the monies that are received by our kids do go to support our missions work in Honduras, Love and Faith Ministries with Pastor Solomon. Now, there are several other announcements before the kids are dismissed to go to junior church. First of all, the angel tree is up. 
the angel tree is up and it has little tags on it, you are invited to take one of those tags. Uh, it has an, a, a, either a boy or a girl on it, and it has an age on it. And this year we're using the tags that come from a Helping Hands, and so there's an age range on them. Uh, take your tag, uh, sign up on the sign-up sheet there on the wall just so we know how many tags are out and who has which ones. Now, it's a quick turnaround. Uh, we, we, you get your tags today, and the gifts need to be back really by not by Sunday, but by Tuesday following after that. So we're only talking seven, nine days, I guess. Nine days down the way you have to get your gifts and to bring them in. We may should have put up the angel tree a week earlier. We chose to wait until after Thanksgiving and into Advent before we put the tree up. So that's the drill on the tree. All of the gifts are to come back uh, unwrapped. And we take them all to Rockwall County Helping Hands, and Rockwall County Helping Hands will distribute those to their clients uh, that are in need of presents for their children for Christmas. And that toy distribution takes place on the, I want to say the 11th, 10th, on the 10th. Check your calendars, whatever the Saturday is right in there, either 10 or 11, I think it's 10. Uh, Make sure they have your, uh, that's the toy distribution. Now, you can work that toy distribution. You can volunteer to help distribute the toys to the Helping Hands uh, clients. And all you have to do is go online, find uh, the place. I'll try to find that link this week and put it on the website so that you'll have it readily available. But you can go to helpinghandsrockwall.com uh, and you can find out how to uh, volunteer to help with that toy distribution. So we got the angel tree. Uh, for you to buy a toy to donate to Helping Hands. Uh, you can work as a volunteer at Helping Hands on the day of the distribution. And then, I believe that is on the 10th, because on the 11th then is our Christmas program here at the church, 6 o'clock on a Sunday evening, December 11, 6 o'clock, all right? And then the uh, follow, the, and then the next thing on the calendar, all of these were in the slides. You'll see them next week. They're also on the, uh, the sign out front if you want to check those and write them down in your own calendars. The one out, uh, and the next date is for our candlelight service. And it's going to be on a Wednesday night, December 21. Wednesday night, December 21 at 6.30, all right? And that will be our candlelight service. And then every so often we have the opportunity of worshiping on Christmas Day. And this is one of those years. Christmas Day falls on Sunday. And so we will have a special worship service at 10 o'clock. We will not have Sunday school. And we will have the, a, and I'll keep it to an hour or less for our morning worship Christmas Day, 10 to 11 here, and it's just a great celebration. It's a great thing. Get up, have your, your Christmas morning, get your Christmas breakfast, get here by 10 and worship together, and then off to your family activities for the rest of the day. So that will be a special day this year on Christmas Day. I think I got all the announcements in. Uh, check, your, check the sign out front as you leave just to double check all those dates. If you weren't, I didn't see anybody writing them down. I see some phones out. Maybe you're putting them into your phones. That's good. That's great. I see Marge shaking her head. Yes. Okay, way to go. Everybody follow Marge's lead here. Put those dates into your phone and get them on. All right. Um, can you tell I'm excited about Advent? Excited about Christmas. I don't think anybody else in the room is excited about Christmas, are you? Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, there's, there's, a, there's one here on the front. There's two on the front row here that are excited about Christmas. I guess you saw Talena's Facebook page, right? And she put up her new profile, has on a Christmas shirt. And I said, yes, Talena, you can start wearing your Christmas shirts now. Uh, if it was up to her, she would wear them all year long. Uh, she would sing Christmas songs all year long. The Christmas tree would be up all year long. So, um, and, so why don't we do that? A lot of people are agreeing with me. Maybe there's some that aren't. I don't know. But it's exciting to be in Advent. Children are dismissed to go to junior church at this time. 
in nursery, sorry. I apologize if the temperature in the room is not uh, to your liking. It's difficult this time of year uh, to because we op- might have the heat on in the morning to, to warm up the room, but then by the time service is over, we need the air conditioner on. So it's kind of difficult to know how to regulate the heat. Hopefully you're comfortable. What is the most exciting Christmas you ever experienced? That's a rhetorical question. I'm not expecting you to answer me, but think about it. What is the most exciting Christmas you have ever experienced? You realize that stuff doesn't bring true Christmas joy. Jesus brings true Christmas joy. Jesus and real love, that's what it's all about. And so my prayer for you is that that you this year will have one of the greatest advents, one of the merriest Christmases that you will ever have. And it's all because you are with me in this great adventure. Adventure, get it? Great adventure? The great adventure. That's what we are going to be in Uh, a a series about as we go forward through the four Sundays of Advent and then Christmas Day. The great adventure. Now, it's going to take some effort on your part. It's just not going to happen automatically. It's just not going to happen because it's just going to come along. It happens with a little bit of effort that you have to put into it because you have to make sure that you're not just being... Oh, I'm excited about all the gifts I'm going to get. Oh, it's all about what I'm going to get. And you really, really, really want to experience Advent for what it's about. The ready for the great adventure of Jesus being present in your heart and in your life in a meaningful way. That's what Advent is all about. So how do we understand this great Advent, this great adventure that we want to start with? Well, the first coming of Jesus... It's what we talk about, obviously. That's the context of what we want to look at this morning. But I want to give you a behind-the-scenes view. The up-in-heaven conversation that took place. The place of understanding this uh, this, all comes together and is understood when you turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Not exactly one of the, uh, the, the, the Advent... Passages. I mean, not the Christmas story, but it is about Advent. It is about Jesus coming that first time. And Paul gives us a glimpse in Philippians chapter 2. He gives us a glimpse, not just a glimpse, but a, a behind-the-scenes look. And believe me, you could take an entire seminary class on just this passage of Scripture this morning. It is that deep. It is that theological, and I may have lost some of you right there when I said theological. Don't be, because you do have a theology of God. You do have a theology of Christ called a Christology. You do have a a theology and an understanding of who God is. It's just simply your your understanding who God is. God, theology, theos, God, ology. You put ology with everything, right? Biology, uh, psychology, and on and on. It's the study of God, your understanding of who God is. And so we look at this passage, and we start in verse 5. Verse 5, Philippians 2, 5. I'm going to read out of the New International Version this morning. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
Therefore, my friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my present, but now much more in my absence, as Paul saying this, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Wow. What does all that mean? Well, I could summarize it like this. I could just say one sentence and then we could be finished, right? Rejoice. Jesus rescues us so that we can reach out to others. Christmas is the story of the great adventure of Christ when he came to rescue us. That's what it is. That's what it is. And so let's look at this. Let's just summarize the headlights. First, the headlines. Headlights? Headlines. Or whatever. First of all, God, Jesus was and is fully God. See that in verse 6? Jesus was and is fully God. Verse 6. He who in very nature God. You see, before Jesus was born, he existed. He pre-existed. In fact, if you look into Colossians, we find he was in the beginning. And all things were created through him and by him and for him. Remember, I've preached a series on Colossians before. And, the, and the, all of Colossians is simply just saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. That's what Advent is about. That's what Christmas is about. That's the one in whom we have hope. So, is Jesus fully God to you? What kind of Jesus do you follow? Is it the one who is all God? Because that's who the Bible says that he is. He is all God, fully God. Second highlight is that Jesus was living in heaven prior to living on earth. He was in a real place although it was a spiritual place that we can't even imagine. Nevertheless, it was a fantastic place of glory, of majesty, of wealth, of worship, filled with angels and music and beauty and power and purity. And That's the place that Jesus came from. Jesus himself said in John 6, I came down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Which raises the question, did Jesus have a choice about coming? Did God the Son have a choice about coming? I believe he had this choice about this mission. Verse 6, look at verse 6, goes on to say, He, Jesus, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, to be used to his own advantage. The New Living Translation says something to cling on to. He didn't consider this equality with God, his godhood, his nature as God, something to hold on to. you got to understand this. First and foremost, God the Son and God the Father are equals. That's what the Trinity is all about. Understand that all are fully God and fully equal, and because the Son is equal in authority, when the Father asks him to go on this great adventure, would you go on this mission, he says, to save humans that we have created? Jesus, God the Son, had a choice. He could have said, no, I'm just going to hang on to what I have here. I'm just going to cling to this godness, use my godness to my own advantage and just stay here in this, this great place that we live called heaven. But he didn't do that. <laughs> That's not the Christmas story. It's just the opposite of that. What happened is Jesus chose to limit his God powers, his superpowers, if you want to think in those terms. The verse 7 says, he made himself nothing. New Living Translation says, he gave up his rights as God, his divine privileges. God, Jesus laid aside not his Godness, as it were. He was nevertheless fully God. He was always God. Rather, he, he surrendered up if you can imagine, he surrendered up this glory that he had, this equality with God that he had in heaven to become one of us. 
and not to use his godliness as a way to take advantage of us. He said, Father, I'm going to leave my miracle working for whatever reason with you, and I'm going to go to God, go to earth without it. Yes, he performed miracles here, but it was all to bring glory to the Father, right? It was never for his own advantage. See, that's what the, the temptations were all about when Satan came to Jesus right after his baptism and began to tempt him, three times he tempted him. And each of those attempts, it was a way to try to get Jesus to use his godly powers for his own advantage. You're hungry? Oh, here's some stones. Turn them to bread. You can do that. Oh, you want the world to see how powerful you are? Throw yourself off the temple. Come, come, come down nice and soft and make a, you know, stick the landing kind of thing. No. Oh, you want all these kingdoms? I'll give them to you. Well, they're going to be Jesus's anyway as he follows the obedient path that he has set out for him. Third highlight that we see in this scripture. Jesus chose to leave his throne for a manger. Now, I want you to get this. God the Son said to God the Father, I will leave heaven for earth. Why would he do that? <laughs> I'm going to leave this palace for a stable in Palestine. Why would he do that? I'm going to leave this place of glory in order to write a new story and a different story for the people of earth. Or maybe it would have been like, I'm going to trade my mansion for an adobe house for a while. That's what he's doing. John 1 says, the word became flesh and made his home among us. He became one of us to live with us. I love the message paraphrase of John 1, 14. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. He moved into our hood to live with us, to be one of us. Fourth highlight is that Jesus became fully human. Now, wait a minute. He's fully God. How can he be fully human? I don't know how that works. But he's God, remember? <laughs> and so he became fully human, yet still being fully God. Verse 7, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. In other words, Jesus wasn't faking it. He was really here in flesh and in blood. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest speaking of Jesus that is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way. The Bible says in every way. He, Jesus, was tempted just as we are. The big difference is that he did not give in to it. He remained without sin. He could have sinned even though he was not born with the sin nature as we are. He still could have sinned. How could that be? Well, didn't Adam and Eve sin and they weren't born with the sin nature? So Jesus could have because he was fully human. But yet he remained pure and without sin. Very important. Fifth highlight, Jesus became a servant. Verse 7 says, taking the very nature of a servant. The one who would have been served. Think of this. This is God the Son, the one who would have been served, himself served by millions, if not billions of angels, is now becoming a servant to us. This is the ultimate example of humility. If you don't understand this about Christmas, you're, you're, you're missing the wonder and the awe and the miracle and the power of what Christmas is all about. The fact that he would even do this. Come on, man, seriously? You're going to become a servant? Not just come as a man and be fully man and be fully God, but now you're going to come to serve and to give your life 
for us. See, when you see baby Jesus in the manger, understand that this is a king who has just laid his crown and his royalty and his robe aside for this scratchy hay, these torn strips of fabric, and this diaper that he now has on. This is the one who we worship at Christmas. He has not come to earth to be served, but to serve. And so this raises a question for you and for me at Christmas. Do we believe we will be more fulfilled by getting others to serve us? Oh, what would you get me for Christmas? Oh, I want this for Christmas. Oh, I'm so excited about what I'm going to get. And it's all about, or are we going to be excited about the, having the attitude of Christ and humbly serving others, buying toys for the less fortunate, going and working at the distribution to help serve those. That's really what you're doing when you go to a toy distribution or you go to a soup kitchen or you give a, 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 a coats to those that are in need or blankets to those in need. You're serving them, those in need. Make sure there's a little bit of a sacrifice there because if we serve out of our extra, then we're not much different than the millionaires who give as a tax write-off. Next highlight, number six. Jesus chose to die on the cross for us. Verse eight. Coming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Now, that's an interesting phrase. Jesus became obedient to death. In simple, as simple humans, we have to be obedient to death. You hear me? I mean, right, that's, that's one thing. You know, you, you know the phrase, right? There's only two things that are, that are certain in life, death and taxes. Right? So we're going to be obedient to death. We're going to die. Sorry, you are going to die. Can I tell you that this morning? On this, on this morning of Advent and this morning of hope and this morning of talking about how great and awesome Jesus is, sorry, you're going to die. It's the truth. It's the truth. So we have to be obedient to us. It means that we have no choice in it. But Jesus had a choice. He didn't have to die. He could have called, as the song goes, the old gospel song, 10,000 angels. But he was obedient to death, just as each and every one of us have to be obedient to death. And not just death, death on the cross as a criminal, as an excruciating, terrible way to die. Not of natural causes, not instantly in some kind of a tragic event, but as a criminal, as a public spectacle, a humiliation for something he didn't commit. This is Christmas. Yes, it's about Mary and Joseph and the baby in the manger. Yes, it's about the shepherds and the wise men. And we'll have all that played out for us in all of the different Christmas pageants. And in our own Christmas program, we're going to have all of that played out for us. But it's more than that. It's about God the Son choosing to be one of us to die for you and for me. And not just any death, but the worst death possible, a torture death on the cross for us. Now, why would he do that? Because of two loves. First of all, his love for the Father. His love for the Father. The Father loved him. The Father loved him so much that he sent him to die for us. John 14, 31, I love the Father and I do exactly what the Father has commanded me to do. Which raises a question for me. What is the Father asking me to do? Well, if Jesus was obedient to the Father, who was equal to the Father, what about me? 
Am I willing? Am I willing to have uh, to to be to have to sacrifice for those that are in need around me? Jesus demonstrated for that for that that for us. Am I willing to serve others around me? Jesus demonstrated that for me. His love for the Father. Secondly, his love for sinners. Yeah, that, that's us, all of us. All of us. His love for us. You understand, right? He didn't love us because we got our act together. Because most of us don't have our act together. But he loved us while we were yet sinners. Ephesians 2 says, Live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a Fragrant sacrifice, a fragrant offering rather, and a sacrifice to God. So that, that's the great adventure that Jesus went on. That's the behind the scenes look as to how Jesus became, being fully God, became fully man, left his throne in glory to take on the form of a small baby in, lying in a manger, in a stable, in the scratchy hay swaddling clothes to grow up to be like us. Oh, but it's not over. What comes next? Therefore, verse 9, therefore God exalted him to the highest place. Because he was obedient, because he carried through with his mission, because he went on this great adventure for us, therefore... Number one, Jesus is exalted above all things. He exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name above every name. He went as low as you can go. He went as low as we can go. He paid the penalty for crimes for us so that God would ultimately exalt him to the greatest. Second of all, Jesus is worshipped as king because this was what he came for. That's who he was in the beginning. And that's who he still is. Verse 10, and at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow on heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every knee should bow. You bow. We bow to those in authority over us. Jesus is the ultimate authority. Third, Jesus is to be proclaimed as Lord. I've said this before. Did you know Jesus is Lord? No, wait. It, it doesn't matter whether you believe that or not. Did you know Jesus is Lord? Hear me, hear me good here. It doesn't matter if you think he is. It doesn't matter whether he's Lord of your life. Jesus is Lord. And one day, every knee will bow before him and proclaim Jesus is Lord. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord because he is. He is to be proclaimed Lord of our lives here and now. Are you proclaiming Jesus as Lord with your life, with your lifestyle, with your life choices, with the way you treat one another, with the way you honor God? Jesus is Lord. Lord. And then verse 12, it shifts. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, Paul says, but now now that I'm not there, continue to work out your salvation. I'm so glad he didn't say to work for your salvation. He doesn't say that. It's not to work for your salvation. You can't do anything to gain it by your achievements, by your actions. It is a free gift given to you by the grace of God when you believe Jesus is Lord and he died for you. So with a deep reverence, carry out this life. Work out this salvation. Continue in your salvation that's been given to you through Jesus. How are we doing? Is Jesus Lord of your life? For it is God, verse 13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. 
Jesus is the name above all names. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. That's what Emmanuel means, God with us. This is what Advent is all about. This is what Christmas is all about. The King in heaven, Jesus, is laying aside his divine privileges to be one of us, and not only to be one of us, to be a servant among us, to serve us so that we can be saved. Jesus, name above all names. Jesus, Emmanuel, God is with us. Let's stand together. Father God, we honor you, we love you, and we proclaim that Jesus is Lord. And Lord, may this Advent season be a great adventure for us all. May we all experience Jesus in a new, in a fresh way this Advent season. And in all the hurry and the, the running around and the, 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 the things that we feel like we must do, during Christmas, may we always remember that Jesus is Lord and his name is above every name. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Father, as we leave today, may we begin the Advent season with this, this excitement and this adventure that we have in our hearts because you, God, love us, and you love us so much that you sent your son, Jesus, and he was obedient unto death, even death on the cross, that we might live with you forever in eternity, forever and ever through eternity in heaven. God with us, Emmanuel. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen and amen. God bless you. <laughs>